Welcome to SureDog.com. I'm Ant Walker. I am here today uh, to introduce a new show called Off the Chain. This is a debate show. This is a, a show where the Sherdog personalities that you've grown to love, that you've grown to enjoy our words. Uh, now you get to hear us talk about these issues in depth and, and really get a sense of how we feel and what we think is going on in this beloved sport of ours. So first, Let's introduce uh, the man himself, who's the jack of all trades uh, with SureDog.com. He is one of our editors. His name is Ben Duffy. Ben, what's going on, my man? Everything's good. I am super glad to be here. Excited to kick off this no new show. Nice, nice, man. And uh, oh, joining us also is someone who you know of, but you probably haven't seen before. He's the behind-the-scenes guy for the Sherdog.com live chat show, The Trenches. He's also policing and patrolling the notorious Sherdog.com forums. He's the man known as Jay Petri. What's going on, Jay? You know, it was about time I stepped out from behind the chair. You know, it, it's, a, it's a good thing for everybody, I think. I think we'll all enjoy this. Oh, I, I'm loving it already, man. And we're going to introduce a very good friend of mine, he is of SureDog.com and the Wrestling Observer and LA Times. It's Todd Martin. Todd, how you feeling, my man? I'm doing. I'm doing well, Anthony. Although I gotta say, I, I I haven't been with the Observer for about three or four years now, so I think I think Wade would kill me if I did not say that now with the torch. So uh, it's all good. <laughs> oh yeah. See, yeah. This is what happens when I very very casually follow pro wrestling, and I don't understand all this stuff. But I read your work on the LA Times, so that's what's up. All right, so. Uh, gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started because we do have uh, a few different topics that we want to run through. First of all, Bellator 222 just took place last Friday. A lot of things to talk about from that card. But first and foremost, let's talk about Rory McDonald. Uh, now, there was a lot of speculation that he was done, that his career was a wrap considering his, uh, his, his faith-filled uh, post-fight speech after the draw with John Fitch, and, and that raised a lot of eyebrows, a lot of question marks as to what he had left to offer the sport. He walks away with a decision against Neiman Gracie, and um, now we know that he isn't done yet, and he gave Neiman Gracie his first loss to reach the finals of the welterweight Grand Prix. So let's take a look back at what we've seen so far in this Grand Prix and Roy McDonald's role in it. H how do you think this Grand Prix has gone so far, and, and where do you stand on uh, Bellator's tournaments in general? And, of course, we have a 16-man featherweight tournament that's uh, fast approaching. I'll start with you, Todd. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that I like the Bellator tournaments in general. I enjoy tournaments and I think it's a little bit underserved as a, uh, as a niche in MMA because UFC really doesn't do them at all. So I think it's, it's good to sort of find angles that you can, you can get at when you're another organization um, that, that aren't, you know, being occupied by the UFC. Uh, as far as this particular tournament, the welterweight tournament, um, I don't think it's a been, been a big success for Bellator in that before the tournament, the last title fight they had was between Douglas Lima and Rory McDonald. I think the ideal behind a tournament would be you create some new stars, you create some new matchups. And as we reach the end of the tournament, we get Rory McDonald and Douglas Lima again. Mm -hmm which isn't the end of the world. It's a good fight. Um, and I'm curious how it goes. I think Douglas Lima actually might take the rematch after, um, after losing a close decision the first time out. But I think if you're Bellator, that probably isn't the, uh, the optimal situation you're looking at. As far as the upcoming, uh, upcoming featherweight tournament, it looks great. I mean, they got a lot of veterans in there. They've got a lot of good young fighters in there. Um, I think it's, it's, if you're looking at the divisions and which ones make the most sense to do a tournament, featherweight makes a lot of sense. And I'm looking forward to that one a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, so so Jay, um, g give us your take on this. Um, Roy McDonald did prove himself to still be uh, someone who's wanting to fight. Now, how do you, how do you see this tournament going down with um, a very very tough rematch ahead for him? Well, you know, I I gotta say, and I'm, I'm a man of my word. I was wrong. I thought Gracie was going to get it because I thought, you know, Rory just, he didn't seem to have it in him. He said he didn't have it in him anymore. He didn't want to hurt people anymore. He didn't have that drive, the killer vibe that he, he always has had. And that says a lot. When a fighter has one foot out the door, it just, you always have that hesitation, you know, going forward. And Rory was just blew me away. The way he performed, the way he got out of the submissions, Everything was just ice cold, just perfectly executed, just brilliantly done. But he's got a buzz on for him from now coming forward. He's got to fight Lima again. And if you remember, he couldn't walk out of the cage last night and he fought. It was a really close decision. I, I don't know. I, you could almost flip a coin on the first the first one the way it went. But this one, I don't know. I just I think 
the way Liam is firing, I think this is everything. This is everything he needs to get to be champion for what is it the fourth time, fifth time? I don't know. I can't keep track anymore. They keep round robining. But it's 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 a weird situation Bellator is in with these tournaments when they have the guys they're kind of expecting they are going to win win, and then they stop and go okay, okay now what do we do? And I think they're kind of in that situation. I'm hoping featherweight goes differently. I'm hoping that they put a lot of names in the pot and really mix it up. But if you saw this, this Bell Tour 222, they threw a bunch of guys that should be fighting on the tournament together against each other now for a tournament starting a few months. Pico and Boric and Archuleta and Dudu Dantas. They, I don't know. I feel like they're jumping the gun, but it has a lot of potential. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, so Ben, let me let me get your take on this because I, I want to know if I'm standing on an island uh, in this this uh, hot take of mine. So I was encouraged by what Rory McDonald pulled off. I think he he did a lot of good things as far as the positional awareness. He he was a monster on submission defense that I, that I think should not be understated at all. Like just fantastic submission defense. But as Jay said, kind of uh, they're seeming that he's lacking the killer instinct, like. So Ben, what what are you thinking? Is this is is this going to be the the undoing of him against Lima? I well, first off, let me say that I was not quite as enamored of Rory's performance on Friday night as a, a lot of people, not just Jay, seem to be. I thought he did enough, and he looked good. You know, uh, he he didn't blow me away. He didn't look amazing. The only thing that really stood out to me in a positive way was how completely fearless he was of spending extended amounts of time in nice. Neiman Gracie's wheelhouse. That was like being completely unafraid of Neiman Gracie uh, on the ground was definitely an impressive thing. But other than that, he kind of won in a straightforward manner that a year or two from now, depending on how how Gracie pans out in that time, we may think, well, that, that wasn't all that hot. In the wake of it, and even in the lead up to it, he has still not convinced me that he enjoys beating on people for money going forward. I, I still am not sold that he is back mentally 100%. So all that together, uh, if, if Douglas Lima was a publicly traded company, I'm buying, buying, buying. And I'm buying before the next round of interviews comes and Rory starts saying weird stuff again. <laughs> well, I, I did. I did see something real quick. I noticed. I said this when I was watching the fight. He kept his promise because he didn't brutalize and smash up and hurt somebody when he fought. When he fought crazy, he beat him. He beat him on the scorecards. He 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 beat him. He defeated him. He didn't finish him or hurt him really badly. So no, I, I know. I know what you're saying. Though I got. I get you there. Yeah, I mean, but but I think that's that could be an issue. That that could be a serious issue. I mean, you know, we talk about pugilism as the gentleman sport. I mean, typically that that label is given to boxing, um, but we know that's not really the case. Like, yeah, a lot of these these fighters are you know men of honor in in their uh, specific disciplines. They are uh, men of honor in the way they conduct themselves in life a lot of times, and we've seen cases where that's not the case. Uh, but when it comes, when it boils down to it, they are beating each other half to death for money. Um, and if you're not prepared to beat someone half to death for money, are, are you in the right place? It's very much an open question. I mean, we'll 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 see what happens with Rory going forward. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with wanting to compete that way. I don't think there's anything wrong with not wanting to compete that way. I mean, the the evaluation is just whether you have the out, you know, whether you have the outlook that's going to lead to success. And I think it's very much an open question with Rory right now. All right. Uh, so very curious as to what happens there. Now, I, I think one thing that is that it hasn't been talked about enough as far as kind of what's gone wrong with this welterweight Grand Prix, I wouldn't even say it was the uh, lackluster fight between MVP and Paul Daly, because, hey, sometimes those things happen when you pair people up. Um, so I wouldn't even say it was the, the John Fitch and, and Roy McDonald draw because, hey, Sometimes that happens when you have legitimate competition. The The problem that I found with this is that you let Roy McDonald take a middleweight title fight so um, so close to the start of the entire tournament while he is supposed to actively defend in five rounders during the entire thing should he make it to the next round. Um, I don't know. Is anyone else feeling me on, on that particular uh, opinion? I 
I'll definitely speak up on on that one. It's interesting. I've spoken to Logan Storley twice since the Grand Prix has begun. I would say that Storley is probably the best welterweight in Bellator who's not in the Grand Prix. Uh, or if not, he's on the short list. And it's interesting to talk to him on two different occasions. Uh, people drag racing on your street, Jay? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, to hear kind of his frustration grow. Because the first time I talked to him, he was like, no, it's fine. You know, I'm 9-0. and 0. They had some other prospect guys they wanted to put in. I'm sure my next couple of opponents will come out of whoever gets knocked out of this tournament. Or who knows, maybe I'll be ready for a title shot at the winner by the time it's over. And his frustration has grown as it's gone from something that, oh, this is going to be about a year or two. This is going to be a year and a half maybe before it's done and really derailed by... McDonald taking that uh, middleweight title shot against Musasi. So yeah, I, I think it was a mistake. I really liked how it had been going before. I liked the kind of the way they appeared to draw the matchups out of a hat to start it. I thought that made for some kind of interesting first round matchups. But letting Rory take the detour was a big mistake. And you know, interesting too because um, now this featherweight tournament is about to start, and Pitbull uh, took his detour. Of course, it went a lot differently. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem like that's a lesson that Bellator has really learned. Um, so I, I just wonder what's going to happen with this featherweight tournament now, especially with, like you said, the Archuleta and, and, and Dante's fight, where we just wonder what are they doing here? What's the plan? And it seems to be that they're operating without a plan right now. And I don't know. Well, but let's uh, any any uh, last thoughts we want to have on that, gentlemen? Well, well, it's, it's a car. There we go. They're done. If something that I kind of picked up on and wanted to, to make a point of, and I'm not going to go down the Ryan Bader route. You guys hear enough of that from me on the other side. Tournaments like these, when they don't have the entirety of the division, kind of kill the divisions for a little while, or at least put a pause on them. Sure, there's the big fights in the marquee, but everything else doesn't matter. When, when the heavyweight tournament happened, it de facto killed the light heavyweight division. When I'll give you, I'll give you some numbers because, of course, I have them. So when, uh, when, when Bader fought, he fought to defend his light heavyweight belt in November 2017, and then he moved up to heavyweight to fight in the tournament. In that time, from November 2017 to now, there were 21, 21 light heavyweight fights. That's it. That's the, that's the entirety of the division, because I think I'd attribute it because the champ wasn't there. Now, sure, okay, you can say maybe light heavyweight isn't that big of a deal. UFC had triple that. They had 65 in the same amount of time. And they had the difference. Bellator had a little over half the amount of fights. So the point is, the division kind of went at a standstill. And my curiosity is, with this featherweight division, it'll open them up because there are 16 men in, instead of eight. But... There's more than 16 fighters on the roster. So what do they do until then? They just kind of just hope. What, do Lo what does Logan Storley do in the time off? He fights Awan Pascu, and then everybody goes, okay, now what do you do? But Eric Silva, good luck. Yeah, so uh, once again, operating without a plan, uh, this is this is something that uh, it has plagued this organization before and looks like it's uh, rearing its ugly head again. So another aspect of Bellator 222, and this is probably the best part of that event Friday uh, was Kyoji Horiguchi and, and him now being a champ champ just in a different way because he's a champ of Ryzen and Bellator now at, at Bantamweight. So he beats Darian Caldwell uh, in both organizations, uh, now solidifying himself with those two straps. So where does this accomplishment rank as far as legendary fighter achievements for, for either one of you guys? I'll start with you, Ben. Uh, you're going to start with the guy who's going to rain on the parade. Uh, <laughs> in, a, it, in a subjective, in-the-moment sense, I was incredibly impressed with it. Uh, I expected Caldwell to win this one. I thought the cage was going to work in his favor. I guess because I assumed he would know how to suck a man's hips out from the, from the base of the cage. <laughs> but but uh, So I was very impressed with the actual feat. I'm not ready to call this a pound-for-pound -pound accomplishment on, on Horiguchi's part mostly because i mean he has been undefeated in two weight divisions for a long time since losing that fight to demetrius johnson but if you look at the level of competition he's faced i mean who's who were his best wins at flyweight before or after johnson i would say ali bagatinov and hiramaso gikubo twice 
And both of the, those guys are borderline top 10 uh, flyweights at best. Who's his best win at Bantamweight? It's Caldwell twice. And Caldwell is a borderline top 10 135er. So, I mean, he has done a very impressive thing because in a sport as unpredictable as this, it's hard to stay undefeated for a long time. Weird stuff happens and no weird stuff has happened to him, but it has not been against the murderer's row. I mean, I have a guy I know here in town, name of Colin Wright. He holds uh, belts in two divisions or in two promotions. He is the uh, Fury Fighting Championships, 145-pound champ. And just across the border in Louisiana, he is the AKA, American Combat Alliance, 145-pound champ. It is not a pound-for-pound accomplishment based on the level of competition he has faced. And I'm not saying it's the same for Horiguchi, but if there's a continuum, Horiguchi is between my boy Colin and, you know, say somebody like Henry Cejudo right now. So I, I'm not ready to call it like a, a, a historic thing other than being only the second guy to be a sitting champ in two different promotions. Yeah, so and I, hmm? I only know that because of Jay. So I, I can't, like, I don't want to steal a thunder. I, I got that from Jay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so, so give, give us your, your thoughts here. Where, where do you think this ranks as far as uh, achievements in the sport? Yeah, luckily the uh, people won't have to put away their umbrellas because the rain is is continuing on the parade. Um, I mean, legendary legendary accomplishments is a is a high bar. I mean, I, I don't think it's you know I don't think it's something we're going to be talking about years from now. And I mean, he beat the same person for um, you know, for the the biggest achievement in, in each of his organizations. Um, with that said, I mean, I think I may be a little bit higher than Ben in terms of his um, his his resume as a pound for pound fighter. In that, yes, I mean, you're right that the level of competition isn't as high as, as some of the people you would consider there. But he also also has a lot more wins accumulated and a lot fewer losses than a lot of the people he's going to be up against there. I think when you look at his resume, it's a it's a pretty darn impressive resume in terms of the diversity of places that he's fought, the diversity of people that he's fought, and the ability that he's been able to keep winning in those places. So I, I think I think there's a lot to be said for um, the greatness of, of Kyoji Horiguchi, um, but I, I don't think winning the, the Bellator and, and Ryzen titles is a particularly all-timey credential in his favor. Mm-hmm. All right, Jay, what say you? You know, I, I, I was hot cake city when that happened because it was just such an unusual thing to happen to have not only have cross-promotional work, but then have the champ go over and win it. There haven't been that many guys to, to even try. And, and I don't know if that should get in the way because it's just the opportunity didn't present itself. But I think, I mean, he is kind of a, a victim, I guess, is the best word of opportunity because of the Horiguchi or because of the Coker Sakakibara relationship to get that going. Um, Invicta did that recently. Invicta sent Jimmy Fry, their their Adamite champion, over to fight Ayaka Hamasaki, Invicta's former Adamite champion, and she went over to Ryzen and did great, and then lost lost the third round badly. And because it scored its entirety and not round by round, she got beaten. Were it, were it to happen over here. I mean, she won two rounds to one, but it doesn't matter in that context. But Horiguchi, I mean, he's in, he's, it isn't all time, but it's a really noteworthy accomplishment because I, as Ben introduced, the only other guy to do this in a major organization was Overeem. When he was a strike force heavyweight champ, he went over to Dream to kill Todd Duffy in 15 seconds with a knee that kind of almost retired him, basically, um, and won the Dream Belt. And then fought in the strike force tournament, and then that whole thing happened. So that it doesn't he's he's in unusual, uncharted territory. If, in terms of greatness, it's about as good as it can get for him. It's about as good that's about as good as it can get for a non-UFC fighter these days to not just be the Bellator champion, be the champion in another organization too. But you know, when you look at like the PFL champions, if they fought somewhere else, would you put them on the same page as a as Fedor and his pride run, as Cerrone and all of his wins. No, just because, as you said, the level of competition, it just can't be there. And that's a shame for him. But he's done everything he could along the way to get there. Just, you know, beat Mighty Mouse. And, I mean, if I may, the funny thing is, I mean, you know, I, I jumped into this question and kind of denigrated his accomplishment. If anything, I rate Horiguchi, in my opinion, as a fighter, higher than what he's shown. Like, I think there's a possibility that Horiguchi is the best flyweight in the world right now, and we just don't know it and aren't able to prove it. 
I would love to see him fight Cejudo, and I'd love to see him fight Demetrius Johnson again. I mean, I think there's a good t- chance he, he beats either or both of those guys, but based on what he's done, it's hard to come out and say that conclusively. So just just lest anyone think I hate Gooch. So, so before the, chance, the, uh, the booze come raining down on Duffy, you're, you're backing <laughs> out, I, I see. Um, <laughs> so I, I think one thing that, I mean, of course, this has been heavily talked about, but in the context of the accomplishment, it's very difficult to separate the cross promotional value of this. And that's, and, and, and to Jay's point, I mean, I think that's what's the most important thing here to have someone who uh, legitimately proved that he was the best at that weight class in two different organizations says a whole lot. And then, and I think from a business standpoint, there is, there is something, um, something great about that because this is think about the UFC and pride couldn't even do this. You know, they couldn't put this together for a variety of reasons. So to see uh, two promotions that are considered lower tier to the to the UFC uh, by a lot of folks, this accomplishment means a lot in that sense. Now, from a competitive standpoint, I think I'm somewhere in the middle um, uh, of all you guys. I'm I'm high on it because I think so highly of of uh, Horiguchi as well. Uh, but he still hasn't faced the the upper echelon of names, but he's done away with everyone in such ridiculous fashion that weren't the upper echelon of names. We got to start talking about him in those conversations, I think. All right. I mean, he, he might he might get the chance. One one in rising, you never know if they might start talking. And then if, if Money Mouse wins that tournament, hey, they can meet again. All right. And, and that's the case. He won't even have to cut weight. Uh, what's up, <laughs> no, a, a big thing too is like I don't know that I necessarily value like the multiple promotions as, as much as as maybe some of you guys do, but I think that the reason you would argue in favor of that is the idea that there are attributes about the different organizations that are different and and achieving success in one of them is different than achieving success in another we've seen a lot of japanese fighters have a lot of success in japan then go over to the ufc and not do that well and horiguchi really broke broke the mold in the opposite direction in terms of doing very well in the ufc leaving of his own accord with a, a you know a really impressive record there and there aren't a lot of people that have done that had success in the in the ring in japan um against you know the competition there then to come over to the states and do very well in the octagon as well i think I think that's something that may be more difficult than people give credit for. Um, but it's hard to judge because that's something we've seen more in one direction. People coming from um, the, the ring in other direct, in other promotions to the, to the cage in the UFC. Not a lot of uh, high-end UFC fighters going to fight elsewhere while they're still at the top of their game, with the exception of, you know, Chuck back in the day and, and Rico and people like that. Yeah, good, good, very good points there. And that's that's an aspect of this that, probably is the least talked about, you know, to have that level of success with the different rule sets, which greatly, greatly changes the game. Uh, even just the scoring system can greatly change the strategy. So, uh, yeah, good stuff there, Todd. All right, so uh, let's let's uh, move on to the other um, big happening, one of the other big happenings for Bellator 222. Of course, this was after the fact. Um, so when the, the event was over, Scott Coker announced that the last emperor, Fedor Emelianenko, isn't in fact retired after all. Um, he signed a multi-fight deal in sort of a, a farewell tour. And the possibility of Josh Barnett or Rampage Jackson as opponents was floated. Uh, what are your thoughts on us not actually seeing the last of the last emperor? You know, I have such mixed emotions about this. Because Coker and Fedor have their relationship going back to the Strike Force days. He kind of pulled them out of there. But do we really need to see Affliction Trilogy re- redux? Because was, I mean, the last time it happened, Barnett killed the company. Quite literally, Josh Barnett tested positive for anabolic steroids. And as a result, they had to cancel the event and the entire promotion went. I'm sure there's more behind the scenes that went down. But the point is... The last time this happened, it was about the worst thing. You, you think Tony tripping on a cable is bad. Oh, buddy. So I, I don't know. I, I think the only way I will personally be satisfied is if they throw it at the Ryzen, let, let, let them have it over there, and croak up Fedor or two. For all the marbles, you can name it something silly, the, the share and, and whatever, farewell tours, and, and get it that way because it just doesn't – do we really need to see this again? Sure, he can go out with a couple wins in the cage, and then we go, all right. But then what do we do? We just 
What happens if he gets sparked? What happens if he fights Rampage, stands in front of them, and like Rampage has been begging for it for so long, and Rampage throws a right hand, and then Fedor sleeping? What do we do from there? So it's why I love I love we all love Fedor, but what do we have to gain from this besides a couple more bucks in his bank account? Yeah, I I just don't see the value in this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, he's not the Rolling Stones. Like, why is he going on on a farewell tour? It just doesn't make much sense to me. Um, and, and then also, you, you just it's like when when does it end? When is is a retirement actually a retirement? Now he has every right to compete as long as as long as he's physically able to walk into the cage and make that decision on his own. Knock yourself out. But at what point do we stop considering this high level mixed martial arts is the question. I think I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel a, a little BJ Penn right now. I, I don't know if is, is anyone else feeling me on that, Ben? You feeling me on that? It's not quite to the pen level, uh, but certainly it's trending in that direction. I'm glad at least that they're explicitly saying that this is a farewell tour. Uh, I'll say this. I mean, I've always been of the opinion that fighters do not owe us a legacy. They owe their families the best uh, living they can earn for them and the best physical and mental state that they can be in for them after they retire. That, that's that's what they're there for. If, if I derive any entertainment out of it, then it's a synergistic relationship. But fighters do not owe us legacy, and whatever they do after their prime, I can stop watching. Penn is actually the first guy to make me start rethinking that. <laughs> for like, <laughs> like, dude, I, I can't ignore this, and, and, and you're, you're, you're ruining my early 30s, so please, like, <laughs> please stop. <laughs> I don't think Fedor's there. I, I can ignore this. I, if he fights in Japan for, you know... Uh, you know, 1.5 million yen and, and all the horse steroids, that's fine. You know, I'll, I'll enjoy it. Uh, just keep him among the other 40-something sets, and we're fine. You know, let him fight in low-stakes fights with other guys that are kind of on the same kind of farewell tour, whether it's called that or not. Like, Rampage is just here to pick up a couple more checks. He's been here to pick up a couple more checks for about seven years now. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew I, I knew it was going that way when I saw him at a press conference and it became obvious he did not know the weight class the fight was in that he was fighting in like four weeks. Uh, it so, probably just didn't matter at that point either. It, it, so he wasn't I, making 205, I'm sure. No, so I, I'm not against it. You know, Fedor can do what he wants. I, I will check in if I feel like it. Just don't put him in front of anybody that's going to really hurt him. All right. Uh, so, so, Todd, any, any thoughts on this? I'll say this. I hope that Fedor isn't fighting in in Japan for 1.5 million yen because that is, by today's translation, it's $13,837.88. <laughs> so that's a, that's a pretty brutal payday for uh, for my man if you were to do that. But yeah, I, I, I think largely similar to you guys. I think I think the best argument in favor of uh, of of arguing against fighters not continuing. And I, I'm uncomfortable with that argument as, as it sounds like you guys are as well, just because it's their lives, you know, it's their livelihood, you know, let them do whatever they want. I, I think that the, the to, to make the best argument possible, I think the argument is not about legacy, but about their safety and their well-being. And I think it's fair for fighters to think, look, you know, uh, putting aside like how we view their their legacy, we want them to be healthy when they're older. We don't want them to deal th with brain in issues. And if we speaking out as fans can make it less likely that they're going to do that and hurt themselves in the long run, maybe that's maybe that's a, a laudable goal. I think that's the best argument for it. I still lean towards let them do what they want. As far as this in particular, doesn't hold a lot of appeal for me, honestly. But I will say this, Bellator, relative to other organizations, does at least match them with older people. So you've got two older fighters, they meet each other, you recognize neither of them are what they used to be, and it doesn't feel quite as sad as when you match up one of these guys that was a legend, and they're facing someone now that you know is like a younger fighter that's, you know, 30th in the world and it's just like a reminder like oh that's kind of sad this guy isn't what he used to be as far as like because you brought this up as well anthony the, the 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 wisdom of doing this whether there's that much interest for it from a promotional standpoint i mean that's the big balance for bellator and coker i think he's gambled the wrong way but i get why he's gone the way he does the argument in favor of this is when you bring in these older names you can draw better than you can with the people that are that aren't as well known and we've seen with coker you know the the biggest uh, the biggest uh, ratings that he's gotten is through more freak show fights with mm -hmm. people that really shouldn't be there. 
um, in the uh, in the cage anymore. That in the short term benefits you and, and, and does better than the alternative. The problem is that when you're doing that, you end up chipping away at the foundation of what you're doing. It makes the people that are younger up and coming fighters feel less special because you're building it around the people that are older fighters. And if you're building around and emphasizing the idea that, well, the biggest stars here are just the names from the past, then you really can't become a bigger star right now because no matter what you do right now, you haven't been a big name in the past. And so I think Coker's mistake in in Bellator has been continually building on these older people, which has led to short term returns. But it's made him a lot harder to create newer stars. And Bjorn Rebney, for all his mistakes, um, I think did a lot better job of creating new stars for the organization than Coker has. Yeah, excellent points there. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it, when you're looking at it in that context, like yeah, Fedor isn't going to rematch Ryan Bader or anything crazy like that. Um, we're, we're not going to see him against any, any young killers. So that's a good thing. But, you know, I guess the, the senior, the senior circuit has to continue in in some way, shape or form. All right. So, um, the other big takeaway from Bellator 222, uh, was from the man himself, Chael Sonnen, the American gangster who retired after losing a a brutal knockout against Lyoto Machida in, uh, I guess another continuation of the senior circuit. So, um, just want to ask you guys: How do you think you're going to remember uh, Chael Sonnen? What, what's your your fondest or worst memories of the American Gangster? I gotta say, he's by far, without a doubt, the best undefeated fighter that has 17 losses that has ever existed. I mean, <laughs> he, he raised the bar. I mean, he he's 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 an entertainer, and he really was one of the, I don't want to say the first, because there have been plenty before, but he was the big one to really make people think, okay, we need to have fun out here. This is entertainment as much as as it is an athletic competition. If I lose, if I win, it doesn't matter, because he gained more fans most of the time in losses than in wins. When he was a toe away from beating John Jones, he raised his level just a little higher than Anderson Silva, both of those fights. He was, you know, he beat Nate Marquardt, which was a a great fight to to get that shot. But he put himself on the map with the loss. That's something that doesn't happen very often. Alexander Gustafson is about the only other big name I can think of that puts their name on the map with with an emphatic loss. But, I mean, he, he was... In my heart, he'll always be the, the final WEC champion because he beat Paulo Filio, who was the champion, but he missed weight by seven pounds and he was speaking to something in the cage with him when they were fighting. We, we don't know what that was. Um, but if, if he's the, the best, then Jeremy Horn has to be right here because Jeremy Horn beat him three times. But, I mean, he's, <laughs> my, my biggest memory, of course, has to be when I saw him uh, in Boston choke out choke out shogun hua because what that that that's about what, what were the odds on that get plus 1500 to submit shogun hua and and just everybody the whole arena just they didn't know what to do because not only he beat shogun he beat he choked him out and just it was raucous and incredible and he was a rock star and he he lived the rock star mma life but it takes a lot of energy to be a rock star so you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with I'm happy with the way things went in his career. I hate you so bad right now. <laughs> All right, Ben, uh, share share your your Chael Sonnen memories. I'm sorry, was that to me? Yes. You know what I. I, I have the feeling that that you know if this retirement does stick, <laughs> there will be a lot of people who. Try to either dismiss or exalt Chael Sonnen just by hanging one single word around his neck. I mean, whether that is like legend or cheater or game changer or criminal or troll or or consummate entertainer, whatever it is, they're wrong. I mean, he he is too complex a fighter and he leaves too complex a legacy in the sport uh, to to be encapsulated by by one word. I mean, on paper. He was a very good fighter who was in the right place at the right time with the help of a lot of uh, Mm -hmm. exogenous testosterone, you know, that got to, you know, two title shots, you know, who might not have in any other era, any other place, any other time. But he made the most of his moment. He changed the sport more than all but a very small handful of fighters. 
And all the other fighters in that handful are much more accomplished in a historical sense than he is. He changed the game on pure, really on pure moxie and, and want to. This guy was a quiet, dull wrestler in and out of the cage for about the first 20 fights of his career. I mean, raise your hand if you remember any Chael Sonnen fights from before he was Chael Sonnen. Well, uh, just the Polo Filo <laughs> fights, that's it. I, I, I mean, well, yeah, WEC Chael. He was just another dude. He won some fights, he lost some fights, and he was a, a pretty bland interview. I mean, he, he changed himself and changed the game through pure force of will. It's going to be a hell of a legacy, and we'll be talking about it for a long time, whether you love or hate him. Yeah, definitely agree. Todd, what about you? I mean, it's been fun to experience his career, and as we see sort of the end of some of these people's careers, it's it, it's fun to look back as having been able to take in some of that. Because I mean, I was there, and, you know, cage side in the first row for that Paulo Fiolo fight that was so weird, watching Fiolo, you know, freak out. And this guy that I mean, people forget, but I mean, he was undefeated. You know, he was thought to be the best guy in that division, and it was just such a a strange fight. I remember going to his his athletic commission hearing in in California, and he brought this entourage of like family members and friends and after they didn't get the answer they wanted they were you know down in the lobby cutting promos on the athletic commission it was a it was a bizarre scene and and a lot of a lot of fun to be uh fun to be had but to me like Chael Sonnen's career comes down to the the first Anderson Silva fight because you can you can very well separate everything that came before it leading up to that and everything coming after that stemming out of that. I mean, this was a guy as as Ben alluded to that had a career that was not particularly notable, um, didn't particularly stand out. I mean, he was a solid veteran, but he wasn't somebody that people knew. And then he he got the 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 revelation in his head around the time of the Yushin Okami fight. Hey, if I start talking myself up, I can get noticed here and. And he talked and he talked and he talked and he talked and he got this guy who was this legend, you know, one of the greatest fighters of all time. And, and he bad mouthed him. He said he was going to, you know, it was going to be a one one sided ass up and he was binging the hammer. Um, and he talked people into believing in, in the idea of this fight. He talked me into believing it. I wasn't going to attend that fight. About two weeks out, I was like, hell with this, and put in a late credential of, of, uh, 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 application and drove from Los Angeles to Oakland to see Chael Sonnen fight Anderson Silva um, on, on short notice. I mean, the, the he he made you believe that this was going to be a big event, and then, to me, that, that fight stands out as one of the legendary fights. I think that, you know, we still see you know, these documentaries about various fights and in, in boxing in particular, you know, you'll have more documentaries about, about, about Ali and Frazier, you know, going back, you know, constantly bringing these things back, Tyson and, and Buster Douglas. I am convinced that in, in 20 years from now, you're going to be having people putting together documentaries on the Anderson Ch Silva Chael Sonnen fight, showing those promos of all those things that Anderson Silva, that Chael Sonnen was saying to build up that fight for a new generation that hadn't seen any of that. And then this fight that's so dramatic, this guy that goes in there, he was, you know, whatever, five to one, six to one underdog. People aren't giving him a chance to win this fight. He goes in there and he takes it to Anderson Silva, takes him down, pounds him out. He's dominating this fight. It, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, okay, this fight's over. I'm mentally processing. What does it mean that Chael Sonnen has done this to Anderson Silva? What does that mean for Anderson's <laughs> legacy? What does that mean for Chael's legacy? And then because MMA is a great sport where it can turn at any moment. Anderson throws up that triangle, catches Chael, and it's all over. And it, it, Chael's legacy from then on was completely changed. And Anderson's legacy was completely different after that because of what happened in that fight. It was a career-defining performance, not only in terms of what it reflected about the way that Chael, what Chael brought to the table in terms of the showmanship, but also in terms of what his ultimate legacy was, which is this guy that came so close and fell short against a guy that came that there was the, the great enduring champion of, of, of that generation. I, 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 my personal uh, memories of Chael Sonnen. Uh, so that fight, UFC 117, I was bartending at a, at a sports bar in the DC area and we showed all the UFC pay-per-views. And I remember uh, they knew to put me on the service bar because I don't want to talk DC to any customers. DC misses you, by the way, Anthony. Oh, hey, I got, I, I, I got to come back. I'm, I'm gonna come back soon, man. We're gonna hang out, and and like I'm, I'm, I'm at the service bar, like not really doing my job because I'm busy watching this fight. And this was a regular thing during UFC events, but I was really not doing my job, and I really didn't care. 
because I was watching historic, uh, an historic occurrence. I was watching Anderson Silva get his ass kicked, and this was something that I never thought was possible. Um, and, and by this guy who I kind of remember fought in the WEC. <laughs> so, <laughs> so th- this this was really a, a, an amazing moment. Um, and and then after afterward, of course, you know that was that was the defining moment in his legacy. But then you see when the PED stuff comes out, when the, you know, the real estate fraud and all these all these black spots against his uh, against his name and his reputation. But the guy just kept falling upward. You know, he loses uh, the, the rematch to Anderson Silva and somehow finds himself in the light heavyweight title fight after coaching the ultimate fighter. He gets fired from Fox Sports for blatantly lying about his steroid use, and ESPN hires him two days later. <laughs> uh, and, and I was told, I remember when I when I worked uh, as uh, Jordan Breen's co-host, our old colleague, um, for his his old show on, on Sherdog sure Radio Network, I remember he told me, like, when you meet Chell Sonnen, he'll make you feel like you're his best friend, and it's just a gift he has, and everybody just loves him. And when I did meet him at, I think it was, uh, yeah, UFC 235, when I was sitting at the, um, the early weigh-ins right behind ESPN's broadcast position. So you probably could see the back of my head in there if you look on the stream. But, you know, in between their, their recording, uh, I, I was talking to him and, you know, cracking jokes back and forth. And it's like he has this charm about him where you just understand like, oh, that's how, that's how he keeps falling upward. That's how he got he got hired after he got hired by ESPN after after getting fired by the the lesser version of ESPN. It, you know, this is how he got his title shot at light heavyweight after losing the middleweight title shot. It, it just was magical to see this and like, wow, that, this makes sense. That's that's Chell Sonnen, I think, is the falling upwards with charm and a smile. So um, he's he's one of those guys that you love him or hate him. The sport will miss him as a competitor, but I don't think this will be the last if we see him necessarily. Don't be surprised if uh, we get a a tweet from Chachri talking about Chell is going to fight Vitor Belfort in in, in one. Don't, don't be surprised. You heard it here first. That is my prediction. Chell versus Vitor. That's going to happen. All right. So Anthony, one, one point. I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, across the board there. I would dispute one thing though, which is uh, falling upward to me. Like that's with someone that isn't succeeding what they're doing. Yeah. Chael was losing the fights, but a lot of MMA is promoting yourself and he was getting interest in the fights. And that was the reason they get him. They, they got him more fights. I mean, he was succeeding in what the UFC wanted him to do, even if he was losing the fights along the way. Now you can, you can, uh, you can, criticize the UFC for doing that, and I did. I thought that John Jones was a ridiculous fight to make um, given the circumstances, but Chael was doing exactly what they asked of him in terms of why he was being put in those positions. Yeah, very very good point there. And speaking of Chael Sonnen, uh, he did um, a, a lot of work over the weekend. Not only did he eat flying knees from Leota Machida and, and leave us all teary-eyed in the uh, post-fight press conference, but he also managed to get an exclusive sit-down with a uh, former Bantamweight champion of the UFC, TJ Dillashaw, in which Dillashaw uh, was admitting his EPO use and gave some reasons as to why, citing uh, the difficulty in making 125. Um, now, are you buying or selling this? Uh, does it do, does it make you think any different about the situation? I'm going to start with you, Ben. I don't care why you use PEDs. I mean, for one thing, I mean, as always, I will lead with the caveat that I'm one of those weirdos that in general doesn't really care about them. I think a lot of the substances that are currently banned should be legal, like out of competition during training camps. I I think we'd have fewer blown weight cuts, fewer uh, fights canceled due to injury. Unless you're walking into the cage high on PCP or with a needle actually falling out of your ass, I don't really care. (laughs) Having said that, (laughs) if you have... Very, very low. Very, very low. If you have been busted, I do care that you've broken the rules that are in place because I I do believe in at least a nominally level playing field. So if you took substance X, in this case, uh, EPO, I don't care why, unless you have an interesting story like your Tim Sylvia saying, I thought you guys deserve better than like a heavyweight champ with love handles. I don't care. (laughs) I do not care. You cheated. Go take your time out and, and come back or don't. I could not give less of a damn. 
So, Todd, I'm going to save you for last because I, I, we we had an interesting exchange about this, and, and I think we should get into that. So, Jay, uh, tell me, what, are you buying or selling T.J. Dillashaw's uh, excuses or reasons? You know, the whole situation makes me look at what Demetrius Johnson said just in a way different way because he kept telling T.J., hey, Take a fight of flyweight first. Don't just jump into a title shot. I dare you to come down to this division and see if you can hack it first. And now, in just in hindsight, looking at that, it's it's incredible because he couldn't. He physically was am, unable to make the weight. His his said he was crashing and he was six weeks out. He couldn't he couldn't function. And okay, if that happens, maybe uh, don't take the fight. You know, if you feel like you can't, you know, get up in the morning, you feel like you're going to die, maybe maybe tap out on this one and come back, come back another day. Um, I, I buy it only, only because it makes a lot of sense because he's a big, he's, he's, a, you know, a big guy, you know, making flyweight was not an easy thing. He looked dead on the scales. We talked about that uh, before when he was making the weight. Um, but Going to what Duffy said at the end, you know, he broke the rules that we have very clearly established using a substance that only the, you know, some of the cheaters of, of renown have gotten, have popped for them. Lance Armstrong popped for EPO. Uh, Shane Mosley, Gerald Miller just recently had that whole thing happen. You know who else popped for EPO? Chael Sonnen. You know, I, uh, <laughs> there's just a lot of big names. This is not, you don't, you don't accidentally take this substance. You really have to just stop and go, okay, okay, I know what I'm not supposed to do, but I'm really going to do it. And that just, I don't know, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed, if that makes any sense. You sound like my dad. (laughs) That is legit something my dad said to me. (laughs) That's like the worst thing you could ever hear from your dad, too. It's the worst thing. Um, All right, so, Todd. Uh, I, I did save you for last for a reason, and uh, and Jay touched on this, but we had uh, an interesting exchange, and this is this is a drum that you've been beating for a while. I do remember you raising some eyebrows about the um, the whole controversy between T.J. Dillashaw and Demetrius Johnson, and that fight not being made about a year and a half, two years ago, something like that. And I was greeted uh, by a lovely DM from you after my tweet about. <laughs> The same thing Jay's saying where where he's saying that that uh, Demetrius Johnson was right to not take the fight with T.J. Dillashaw uh, without Dillashaw dropping down the flyweight first and, and just to see if it can happen. Uh, so so, Todd, um, I, for one, want to retroactively uh, take a gander at Demetrius Johnson's legacy in light of all this and how uh, Cejudo uh dethroning T.J. Dillashaw in a way and kind of discrediting him before he was officially discredited by USADA and and, and say Demetrius Johnson had it right. I uh, have a feeling that I haven't changed your mind in the past couple of days and you still uh, feel an opposing view. Todd, please share share with the class. Well, I mean, as far as as far as Dillashaw goes in general, I mean, I, I tend to. I mean, I, I don't know one way or another what what he he was doing, but when someone says that the first time they get they got they cheated was when they got caught, I, I tend to view that with some skepticism because it just it, you know it doesn't seem likely in most instances that that's going to be the case. Um, as far as uh, as far as Dillashaw and, and Johnson goes, I mean, if Johnson's argument was I don't want to fight this guy because I think he's a cheater, um, then I think it would have more pertinence to. Uh, to, to the uh, to the conversation, but as far as um, as far as him needing something to make the cut, as I mentioned to you, I mean Dillashaw has fought something like 15 fights in the UFC before that. He made weight every time. He made weight afterwards when when cut into lower weight. And the guy that Johnson elected to fight instead was a guy that had missed weight something like five uh, missed weight five seven times. That would be really bad. Um, <laughs> it, it, it only made weight something like five or seven times before, and had you know made weight one of two times after. So if if the argument was centered on the idea that I don't think this guy's clean and, and that's why I don't want to fight him, then I think the argument would, would stand out more than if the argument is uh, I don't want to fight him because I don't think he's going to make weight because, again, he made weight every time before, he made it after, and the guy that he ended up fighting instead, um, is, you know, yeah, exactly, has is, is, is made weight about as, uh, as poorly as anyone in, in UFC history. 
Now, see, one one thing that I simultaneously love and simultaneously dislike about you, Todd, is every time we disagree, and we disagree, you know, rarely, regu- you know, pretty regularly when it comes to <laughs> MMA stuff, but I just, just wholeheartedly disagree with that but you say it in such an intelligent fashion that i'm thinking about it a little bit and i'm i'm wondering if i'm right so and i and i and i also say that because you did raise some more eyebrows uh with your your last column uh, about oh God, let's not get into that here oh. <laughs> I, mean, I, still, I, I can i can hear the amateur wrestlers outside my door right now Jeez. <laughs> uh, uh, but 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 actually but but i do think i i do think um your your point of view has has some merit. Now, once again, it's something I disagree with, but you argue a very intelligent point and you lay your perspective very clear. So, uh, to all the trolls, back the hell up. Let 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 Todd breathe. Just just taking some knowledge, man. Todd's a smart guy. So I'll just it. say this: we won't we won't we won't belabor the belabor the point here. But the one the one frustrating thing about about that whole thing is that clearly the thing that we're ta- that people were taking issue with what I wrote was the idea that I was somehow trying to disrespect the sport of wrestling and nothing could be farther from the truth. And when you sort of go out of your way to make it clear that that's not what you're doing and it's clear people haven't read it and they still draw the conclusion that, that you were, it, it can be, it can be frustrating. Um, you know, cause I mean, I, I, ultimately this is just sort of a hobby. I'm, you know, putting out my ideas here. I enjoy engagement. I enjoy, you know, encouraging people to think about things and to think and, and, you know, to challenge their, you know, their thoughts. I don't think, you know, putting out an opinion that everyone else is putting out is going to often be that engaging unless you, you know, put in a particularly interesting way. So getting people to think differently, I find engaging and interesting. Um, But uh, unfortunately in our, you know, in in sports culture, there's so many examples of people that are, are trying to, um, get people angry for the purposes of just getting cheap hits on whatever they're doing. And I think that's created a, a, a generalized skepticism about uh, independent thought in general that I think is, is kind of a bad thing when we talk about discourse. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. This is Can one I, time we do agree. Uh, ben, what's just up? Let me, let me throw in one last thought on the Dillashaw thing because, you know, Demetrius Johnson challenged him with drop down to 125, take a fight there for a show, you can make the weight, and then look at the title shot. And it may just have been that DJ really wanted to say, and pass your drug test, and just was too much of a gentleman to do so. But Cody Garbrandt legit just called him out on the podium a year ago and said, you're taking EPO, I've been in camp with you, you're the guy that showed everybody at Team Alpha Male to use it, a year ago. And he looks like Nostra fucking Damas right now. Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about the Cody Garbrandt rebrand. You, you know, we're we're looking at him in a totally different light now. I'm just I'm gonna say, bantamweight is full of some prickly and dislikable personalities. It takes a lot to make Cody Garbrandt look like a good guy, but but like when you fight, oh, come no, on, when you fight, fuck. come when on, you, when you fight, <laughs> yeah. he, he hasn't read his book. <laughs> so when, when you fight nobody but Dominic Cruz and TJ Dillashaw for like two years of your life, all of a sudden you look like an angel. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And uh, just got back on good terms with Cody Garbrandt, so there we go. That's that's down the drain now. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So um, <laughs> we're gonna move on uh, from from that. Uh, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. So the Tuesday Night Contender Series restarts. I guess by the time people watch this later today. Uh, so, gentlemen, uh, tell me, like, how, how are you feeling about this organization? Are you are you uh, pumped to see season three? Uh, Jay, I'm gonna start with you. I love the Contender series. I, I, I just love everything about it. It's it's a it's a time when when I explain it to people, I feel like I'm shilling just because of how interesting the, the whole idea is. It's an audition show. They all make the same amount of money. They're all on this this stage. This, everything is very vanilla packaging, and yet it's an efficient and sleek little product that you can get done in two hours and go about your day. I mean, I love, I love weekday fights anyway, but then you actually take a look at it. The, the finish rate for the Contender Series so far, and not counting Brazil because, you know, the number, the, there was take delay and there's a whole bunch of funny stuff there. The Contender Series is a 70% finish rate. That's much higher than the UFC. These guys come in to, to, to get the job done. This is the statement fight. And I, I really like 
what it can bring out of these guys. And I mean, it doesn't doesn't hurt that they've already gotten some names out of it. I mean, you look at the you look at the list. You got Sean O'Malley, you got Ryan Spann, you got that Johnny Walker guy. I don't know if you ever heard of him. And you got Greg Hardy. But but most of the time, you know, it works out really really well for the UFC. And, and I think this 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 beats the pants off of the Ultimate Fighter. And everybody says this, and this has kind of been beating this drum for a while now. But this this should be the death knell of the Ultimate Fighter. This should be this should by far be the way to get in if you're not going to just be signed. It's like why the Ultimate Fighter still exists is just the most confusing thing in the world to me, especially with a product like the Tuesday Night Contender Series. Um, I particularly like the fact that these guys are not fighting in an artificial environment, that it's not it's not a manufactured place where you just put a, a bunch of jackasses in a in, in a house and take away every every claim to sanity and any sort of outside uh, release of, of any sort of pent up emotion no family no magazines no television nothing and then you put them in a camp with guys who they don't train with the coaches they don't know and you just see what happens I, I i don't like that i like this format a lot and i like the um the the efficiency of of the product uh, uh so so todd uh tell me man um how, how are you feeling about the tuesday night contender series uh will you be watching yeah, I mean, I I watch all the uh, the contender series fights. I I can't give it that much of endorsement simply because there's so many UFC fights right now that like I don't feel like they need more on the schedule. I, I feel like th they're better off when they have a smaller number of shows. I mean, it's you know it's well past the point this is going to happen, but I think if you have a smaller number of shows, you have people looking forward to them more. I think it leads to more excitement and interest in the sport. Um, with that said, I mean, as as Jay brought brought up, it's a, it's a good f and, and you alluded to as well, Anthony. It's it's a good format for um, for fighting, you take these fighters that know that they not only have to win, but they have to win in an impressive fashion in order to get a contract. You give them a one-off fight, and every fighter in there is looking to not only win, but win impressively, and it leads to big um, finish rates. It leads to exciting fights, and uh, and yeah, the the first the first couple seasons of it have, have been you know one very entertaining show after another. Not necessarily that much of a uh, of a need to be there, but it's you know if you, you know if you put it on, on on UFC Fight Pass on a Tuesday night. I I can't remember ever watching one of those and thinking, well, that was, you know, that wasn't a very entertaining show. All right, Ben, your thoughts. Uh, I don't have anything to disagree here. I think it's a great thing. I think it is a lot of what was the best about the Ultimate Fighter when the Ultimate Fighter was still good with all the BS kind of stripped away. It's just the fights. You get their kind of human story, the, the hook to pull you in. You get it in this encapsulated, like, three-minute thing. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And it's hard for me to see from this perspective because I watch a lot of like regional MMA just by nature of what I do. But if I were the average casual to committed UFC fan, this is a better thing for me because a lot of the people coming in that might otherwise have been coming in through regional promotions, you know, through CES or LFA or whatever, there's someone, oh, hey, I saw him last summer. He, he whooped that guy's ass. I'm excited. So it, it helps the UFC kind of bring its own minor league, basically, uh, into the spotlight a little bit, bit, which is great. And, you know, as a, a Texas guy who follows a lot of Texas fights, I like that it's a springboard for guys down here to get up to the big time. You know, Juan Adams, Jeff Neal, Domingo Pilarte. So, you know, it, I, I think it's a great thing all around. And any weeknight MMA is a good thing for me. Anytime that I'm having to pick and choose what I watch on the weekend – you know, that's a bad thing. Anytime that there's a contender series PFL Invicta on a weeknight that just gets my undivided attention, that's a beautiful thing. All right. So as far as uh, picking and choosing goes, um, let's let's talk about what we're going to be picking and choosing this weekend, because there is a, a lot of a lot of activity in uh, sanctioned fisticuffs. And I think in a, in a very strange <laughs> twist right here is bare knuckle sanctioned. <laughs> barely just barely yep. just barely uh so gentlemen are are, are you going to be watching this uh Pauli Malginati and Artem Lobov and this is I mean quite frankly this is the biggest bare knuckle boxing match of the century for what that's worth um <laughs> so who, so so uh show of hands who's tuning in I I think I'm tuning in I I, I think I'm watching man so uh Todd you're you're the the odd man out you you're not 
uh, drinking the bare knuckle. I feel cool awkward thing. raising my hand on a on a on a video <laughs> format. It just feels sort of weird. I, I didn't raise my hand earlier with Chael, you know, and, and uh, the answer was more emphatically yes on that one. So I felt like uh, I probably shouldn't this time. I'll watch it. I'll watch it afterwards. I don't think I'm gonna watch live. Okay. Oh, what about you, Jay? Live? Uh, you know, I, I'm not a sucker for it. It the, the the novelty really made me curious about it when they first brought it out because they threw it in Cheyenne, Wyoming, because it's the only state that would sanction it. Then they brought it from Mississippi because it's the only other state that would sanction it. Went down to Cancun because you know whatever whatever happens in Cancun stays there. They tried to bring it to New Hampshire. I don't I don't think they could get it sanctioned up there. I don't know that the the whole story, but it didn't. It sounded because they were trying to hold it in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, I believe was the was the place I was supposed to attend that. I was going to cover it for the site because I would be not not terribly far away, relatively speaking. But you know, it's it's the perfect. Bear with me. Perfect avenue for for fighters that don't know what else to do, can't ha- quite can't quite hang in the big leagues, and and still want to punch people. I mean, think of the names that are the biggest names that are on it now: Chris Levin, Chris Lytle, Joe Riggs, Leonard Garcia, Jason Knight. Beck Rawlings. I mean, this is it's the level of competition you're going to get. It's a lot of ex MMA people coming over saying, "Oh, well, I can do this." It's just punching with no gloves on, sort of. But you know, it's 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 always going to be a niche because you know, no gloves on. Except I don't know if you guys have seen Florida. The 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 hand will be gloved except for a little area right here where the knuckles will be uncovered. The rest of it will have a glove on. Because that's what the commission allowed them to do. So it is bare knuckle by the by the knuckles being exposed on the glove, but the rest of it is a glove. That's what's happening this weekend. So that's going to be horrible. I'm wonderful. Yeah, that that just sounds ridiculous. What? Like, yeah, that. So I remember there was a there was another um, bare knuckle organization that was billing themselves as yeah. bare knuckle that had the same the same just exposed knuckle. Um, for the for the the glove, and it was just the goofiest thing ever. I mean, they they fought in a pit or something. It was terrible. Todd's look of complete consternation is my yeah. favorite. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay, well, let, me, let, me get, let, me, let me add let me add something to this. Let me, let me make it worse. Okay, there's another promotion that existed that I watched. I covered one of them. BYB BYB. I don't remember what the Y stands for. It is a trigon, a three sided oh. arena. With a very yeah. narrow place. That's it's back your bro says Dada 5000's promotion, yeah. Dada 5000 promotion. And he's in the ring yelling and shouting about guys. He's not fighting. No, no, no. He's just watching them bloody each other. But it has its... I, oh, boy. The name... The, the triangle is not equilateral. There is a small, narrow portion at the end where you get trapped down. It's called the, the death corner or the deadly corner or something. <laughs> I can't make this kind of thing up. No, the trigon. Oh and yeah, the, and of course the best thing that happened at the event, the fighters flew out of the cage. The, the cage door broke open with heavyweights flying out of the cage, and of course they didn't know what to do because their cage broke. So they had to stop the show for a while and get that going. Yeah, so bare knuckle boxing is it's got a long way to go. At least presumably Dada Five Thousand thought that was a good idea. So like that was his idea. The commission did not, you know, he didn't go to the commission and say, you know, I'm thinking we're going to do this in like a, a normal cage, you know, that's an octagon or a circle like we usually do. And they said, nope, you got to do a triangle. Like that. That is what we're talking about here. Like bare knuckles. Uh, uh, you cover everything except the knuckles. That I mean, that is seriously one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in the context of combat sports. Outside of Jefferson with one glove. Are we going to have like a cylinder cage next like we're just exploring all the shapes C- here cylinder with like guys like dipping their knuckles in broken glass like tong po yeah <laughs> like is this from kickboxer just pure lunacy but but all right so ben let me let me get your take on this um i mean w- quite frankly this is somewhat of an intriguing match maybe for all the wrong reasons between paulie and, and artem um no. and yeah no. No. <laughs> do, do you do you give artem a chance at no. all this can go straight to hell. And one, MMA is bringing <laughs> unprecedented dollars and eyes to bare knuckle boxing, but it's killing it at the same time. Before the MMA guys arrived, if you talk to somebody like the small niche that was into this, they were like, this is the purest form of boxing. These guys, it's a martial art unto itself. They're, they, they're not as quick to punch the head and go head hunting because they might break their knuckles. So you see a lot more body work. So the guys that were actually doing bare knuckle boxing for a certain amount of time before 
it got on the MMA's radar, it really was a different sport. I mean, you, you can take it or leave it. You may not have loved it, but it was an interesting and different thing. It, there was a lot more body work. Uh, then now it's just flooded with MMA or former MMA fighters who in most cases were not that great strikers for MMA and are on the downside of their careers. So all of a sudden it's become exactly what bare knuckle boxing claimed it wasn't. It's just a bloody brawl where people are beating the shit out of each other and it's easier to cut the other guy. It sucks. And uh, Malinaji is certainly the most accomplished boxer closest to his prime to step into this. Because my feel, and I know that you're a bit of a boxing head yourself, and but my feel from people that I interact with both in person and as the editor for a lot of our boxing material is that people who are into mainstream boxing think bare knuckle is weird and, and want nothing to do with it. This is really... It's MMA pulling up the popcorn and, and the folding chair for this. So Malinaji is certainly the, the most credible boxer to step into this. But Lobov is nowhere close to the most credible MMA person to step into it, much less the most credible MMA striker. I mean, he was a 500 fighter in MMA. He was not a great fighter. We know who he is because he is down to ride or die with Conor McGregor. That's it. If there is any justice in the world, Pauly Malinaji is just going to completely piece him up. Uh, I mean, there's there's no logic that says otherwise. Uh, the the only the only thing I can say is that okay, Pauly is not was was never a power puncher. Um, uh, from what I understand, he did have trouble with with uh, the health of his hands. Maybe that becomes a factor. And, and he's thirty nine. Yeah, yeah if he's I, I don't take it as any sort of given that that Paulie's going to win this fight. Yeah, I mean the the thing is, like, even if he doesn't win, what does it prove? Like, literally nothing. Like, we we learn nothing about anything even remotely reasonable in this in this contest. That being said, they probably have my money already, and I'm a fool. <laughs> they got mine. Yeah, so this is we we can we can crap on it all we want, but no. we we'll be watching. We're we're knuckleheads. I, I am everything that I am decrying right here because I'm buying it. <laughs> I'm pro I'm probably gonna live tweet it and I'm probably gonna write up something for Sure Dog about it the next day. So yeah. I have become what I, what I once despised. Yeah, we're we're mm -hmm. disgraceful. We're absolutely disgraceful. Now, while that farce is going on that we'll be watching, we'll also be flipping the channel uh, because. There will be a UFC event in Greenville, South Carolina. Hanato Moicano is going to be fighting the Korean Zombie in the main event. So, uh, gentlemen, give me your thoughts on this particular fight and the card as a whole. Well, I'll, I'll dig it. I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, something that, that made me curious about Hanato Moicano, when he was going to fight Jose Aldo, there was a legitimately loud contingent of people that thought Moicano would finish Aldo with strikes. And that blew my mind because of all the times Moicano has ever finished. So, oh, wait, Moicano's never knocked anybody out. He, that's not his game. He, sat, he submits people or he just overwhelms them. And Korean Zombie is Korean Zombie. I mean, you, 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 the nickname... There are a few nicknames, and I'll get to this in a little bit. There are a few nicknames that truly embody a fighter. That That's it. You, Korean Zombie, you know what you're going to get. You can just picture the Leonard Garcia fights in your head. There you go. And good luck with it. You know, if, if he if he plays to his strengths, he'll, he'll be fine. If, Mo, if Moicano imposes any sort of submission game, well, you know, it's going to slow it down, and Korean Zombie's going to be pinned against the fence and taken down, whatever happens. But the card... It's 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 one of these really strange cards that is completely flying under the radar, which is too bad because they're making a debut in a new state, which should be a big deal. When you go somewhere you've never been before, you should put on a show and then give the fans something to write home about. But I think they have secretly. I, I think this card could really be one of the most violent cards we've had in a long time. If you look at the, the lineup of fights that they're giving us, Lineker Font 2, Bam Bam Barbarina and Root Boy Brown, KGB and Montana De La Rosa. Angel of Death, which also another nickname, Kevin Aguilar, and Dan Ige, Ariane Lipsky, Violence Queen. Yeah, we, we, I know we talked about this last week, but the, the nicknames are really, really spot on for this card. And, I mean, I, I think this is one of those you wouldn't think to turn it on because it doesn't have a huge amount of star power, but this has the potential to be one of those events. Like the, like the card they had, uh, uh, Rockhold Machida in Australia, 
where you know who what okay there's the main event and every fight was a finish that, that this could be something like that oh and by the way matt wyman's back because five years retirement no big deal yeah so what, what do you think about this card uh, it doesn't. It doesn't do a lot for me, uh, to be honest. When I, I when I typically are just, I'm not thinking about it that far in advance. So I'll look at the uh, look at the card about a week and a half in advance. And when I see a Brazilian in the main event, I think, ooh, this could be a good one because Brazilians they typically will put Brazilians in the main event in Brazil. And if you have a card that, with the various cards in different parts of the world, they load up the undercards with people from that region. And so if you're on a show in Sweden, you get a bunch of you know Scandinavian fighters, not necessarily that high level. You get the cards in Brazil, you get a higher level of of cards. Hard. And I look at this one. Okay, it's in South Carolina. Instead, it's their, you know, their their visit the fifty states tour. Um, which, regardless of whether you think that should be a priority or not, it's not a priority for them. And this card, this card does not seem like a particularly high priority for them. Um, as far as the, you know, the 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 marquee um, name value and in terms of the uh, the fighters they're they're putting on the card. With that said, I like the main event. You know, I think I think it should be a good test for both guys. And there's some there's some de- decent fights here here and there. Um, it's you know, it's a card. It doesn't. It doesn't particularly uh, jump at me in in, in a positive uh, fashion. I I I'd, I'd call it you know below average interest level for UFC this year. What about you, Ben? Uh, I lean a little closer to to uh, Jay than to Todd on this one. I think this is a pretty good encapsulation of what a just any other fight night card should be. I mean, there's not a whole lot in the way of top five guys or immediate title eliminators going on, but there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of matchups that are well thought out in terms of probably promising action and having divisional implications. I mean, even if it's not like the number three and four guy fighting for who gets the next title shot, you know, it's a number eight, number 12 person or two former contenders who are on the, on the back of a couple of, uh, of losses and one of them might be out of a job. You know, like Yoder and Kondo, or in, and Kondo, for example. So I, I do like it. I, I look forward to most of the fights on this card, and that's more than I can say for a lot of these. Uh, I'll I'll definitely be checking in for it. Yeah, I, I'm um I, I'm kind of feeling uh, the this card as far as the the level of action that we might see from it. Now, as far as the the name value, it's it's not the the most star studded thing, but. Quite frankly, I watch to see good fights. I don't necessarily watch to see someone just because of their name. That being said, I'll be watching Pauli Malginati and, <laughs> and Artem Lobov fight. So, yeah, so there's my credibility. All right, so, um, so gentlemen, give me your, uh, your sleeper pick for uh, some good fight, good action on uh, UFC Greenville. Uh, start with you, Ben. Uh, Alan Crowder and Jairzinho Rosenstreich. Uh, Ro- Big boy. <laughs> Biggie boy. His name is Biggie boy. Biggie boy, which is like just the most Dutch kickboxer nickname ever, uh, made his MMA debut or made his UFC debut a couple months ago. I don't remember which event it was at, but he had fought like three or four weeks before that, and nobody in the booth was talking about it. Like, if, if that fight had taken place in the states, he probably wouldn't have even been cleared to fight. I think we're going to see Biggie boy like in his actual element here, and. He might completely light up Alan Crowder, or it may just be a firefight, like an undercard firefight for the ages, but I am dying to see it no matter what. All right, what about you, Jay? You know, uh, there, there's a few fights that I'm really curious about. One of the fights that I'm most curious about is a really disappointing thing that's happening. Deron Wynn was finally going to make his debut, and he was going to make his debut against somebody. And then they pulled out. Then he was going to fight Bruno Silva, who was kind of like a, like, you know, Michelle Pereira, the, the Demolador guy who came out and, and, and blew the doors off. You know, the moonsault guy. Anyway, a guy a little bit less exciting than him, Bruno Silva, was about to fight him, just pulled out. So I don't know if they have a guy for him. So that, that kind of, I lost, we lost that one because, you know, how many, how many five to three middleweights do you see out there? I know it's not five three, but he, anyway, um, Aguilar Ige is a fight that I'm really curious about. Now, Aguilar, LFA, legacy fighting champion guy, and, uh, you know, he he's I think he's only lost one fight, and I think it was to, to Leonard Garcia, back when Leonard Garcia was just biting his mouthpiece as hard as he could, throwing bombs, he stood in the way when it went down. Now, I, I, that's his only loss, and he's fighting uh, Ige, who just, just smoked Danny Henry in London just a couple months ago. So uh, I think this is... It's one of those dark horse, exciting fights that you don't really talk about, but 
you know, you kind of sit there, the, the few of us go, what's going to happen? I don't know. And then, of course, Matt Wyman. I, I mean, I, I, I mentioned it before. He's back after a five-year absence, well, four-and-a-half-year absence. And, you know, Matt Wyman's one of those guys. You can slot him on a card, and he's going to try for a fight of the night. You know, you can think of him. Him and Sam Stout and, and, and Spencer Fisher and Jeremy Stevens are the, the, that crew of guys. You put some of those guys together, they're probably going to brawl for three rounds, and we're going to just clap our hands and go, well, that just happened. Um, I think he, he's fighting Violent Bob Ross, and I think they're going to hit each other until somebody falls down. I think this is one of those game plans go out the window kind of fights, and I'm excited for that prospect. Ben, ben, ben disagrees? No, 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 I agree, but Luis Pena did not know who he was oh. when he was offered the fight. That's how long he's been gone. Luis Pena, Pena had to like look him up on YouTube. I don't think Pena had made his MMA debut by then. I think I'll probably include nope. that in a stat. I'm not sure. Like, you're seeing a bridge between eras right there. Yeah. And I feel old as hell. Yeah, that was a, the surprise news of ever for yeah. handsome Matt Wyman to just suddenly reemerge. I, it just, that was the unretirement out of nowhere uh, for me. So, so, Todd, what are you looking forward to on this one? Yeah, he was always an entertaining fighter, too. Um, I, I've been impressed by Montana De La Rosa thus far in her UFC career. I mean, she's been putting together a series of good performances. She's getting Andrea Lee, who's undefeated thus far in the UFC as well. I think it's a good fight for testing both in terms of uh, whether they can move into contendership status in that division. It may not be a, a barn burner of action relative to some of the other fights on the show, but I, I'm interested in the consequences of the fight. Yeah. All right, so I'm trying to take some of my, my personal bias out of this because I want to say Andre Ewell versus Anderson Dos Santos. Mm -hmm. And I, I've interviewed Ewell a couple times, and he's just solid cat. Really like that guy. I, and I do think this is an interesting match. Um, it is a curtain jerker, but I but this is sort of a do-or-die thing for both gentlemen. They're both coming off of losses. And um, and Ewell in particular, he, you know, I, I have an interview with him that's, that's dropping on, on Sherdog later this week where he talks about how he's been – really working his jiu-jitsu in, in, in preparation, and then also how, you know, that was kind of his downfall against Nathaniel Wood uh, at, at UFC 232. So interesting stuff there. Other than that, yeah, I'll probably go Pena and, and Wyman because, yeah, why, why not? That's just such a culture clash. I'll take it. All right. So, so gentlemen, I think that's going to wrap things up for the inaugural episode of Off the Chain. So please let everyone know where they can find you, starting with you, Todd. Where can the people find Mr. Todd Martin? Um, yeah, the Twitter handle is uh, Todd Martin MMA. And uh, if you're a, a wrestling fan, I encourage you to check out PWTorch.com. And uh, we do a weekly podcast there that's uh, a lot of fun. And my shirt off column goes up on uh, on Tuesday. So I've got a new one dropping uh, by the time you watch this uh, today on uh, on Chael Sonnen and his legacy. Nice, nice. Jay, what about you, man? Well, I, I don't know how many people know because I'm the guy I'm the guy in the chair. I'm not the guy in front of the camera. Uh, I write the, the, the series called Fight Facts, the statistics and, and information about all the events that happen, uh, every single one of them. And so you can catch one basically after any major event that happens. So you'll get one after Greenville. I doubt you're going to get one for Bare Knuckle. I'll be watching because I'm a sap. But there's <laughs> just there's been six events, so there's not really much of statistical information. And, you know, these guys are... Oh, hey, a guy who's never fought in bare knuckle just beat a guy in 0 1 in bare knuckle. There's not the kind of information to do that. So, those are my, my fight facts pieces will be out. And then, otherwise, uh, I'll be covering the event in some capacity. And then I'll just, I'll be around. My uh, Twitter, <laughs> the Twitter handle is uh, my name, Jay Petri, easy enough. All right. And what about you, Ben? Where can we find you? On Twitter, you can find me at, at Benjamin Duffy. Not too hard. Uh, I write a lot of material for Sherdog. You can just go to the main page, open that little features drop down, and you'll find me underneath, well, Jay Petrie, Anthony Walker, and Todd Martin. Also, Eric Stinton. Where's Eric? When, when are we going to get <laughs> Eric on one of these? But yeah, I mean, at Benjamin Duffy or uh, all over the site, and it's mostly what you hear here. All right, cool. So uh, I am Ant Walker. You can find me on Twitter at Ant Walker MMA. Uh, so I got a, plenty of stuff coming out on Sure Dog in the uh, next week. And also you can find uh, some of my work on MMA on point. Got a couple of videos that just dropped uh, with freshly written scripts by your man. So check that out as well. Uh, but 
uh, this this is it for for off the chain. So please uh, like, subscribe, comment, do all that good stuff. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Tell that friend to ten ten more friends. And you know what you got to do. You must stay beautiful. You must stay positive. And by all means, you have to stay sexy. I'll see you when I see you. Peace. <laughs>